afternoon. No, no, now it's working. Uh, dear friends, uh, dear members of parliament, coming from Ghana, South Africa, Zimbabwe, Niger, and uh, dear all the people coming to this uh, debate that we are going to have this afternoon in the European Parliament. I'm happy to, to be welcome all of you in Brussels. As you uh, can see, we uh, prepared for you a beautiful afternoon, uh, like uh, if it was in Spain, my country. It's not the normal situation in Brussels, but considering that you were coming, most of m many of you from uh, hot countries, we prepared in this special week uh, the weather in Brussels. <laughs> My name is uh, Enrique Guerrero Salom. I am a member of the European Parliament, socialist member, coming from Spain. And it happens that I am also the co-chair of the Global Progressive Forum, uh, a common initiative created in 2013 by the uh, European Party of Socialists, by the S&D group in the European Parliament, a network of NGOs named Solidar, and a, a think tank, the Foundation of European Progressive Studies. We try to build um, dialogue, to promote dialogue and to build progressive coalitions all around the world in order to fight for a also progressive agenda in a moment of uh, globalization. The GPF is also an active organizer of the Africa Week, a yearly initiative of the S&D Group, our flagship initiative aiming and underlining the importance that Africa has for our political family, socialists and democrats. Our group in the European Parliament has, since the elections 2014, decided to make a strong political priority and to put African relations on top of the European agenda. Our aim is really to change the paradigm of our cooperation with Africa. We want to consider Africa, and we consider Africa as a continent of opportunities, as a continent of intelligence, as a continent of well-prepared human resources, as a continent of the future, as a continent in change, in not only as a continent with problems. We don't want to see Africa, as many other conservative people in Europe sees Africa as a challenge, as a threat, looking at migration, looking at uh, undemocratic situations, we consider Africa as a continent of uh, opportunities, mainly, of course, for African citizens. And for that reasons, we we want to work not for Africa, but with Africa. The, uh, our partnership should and must be based on common interest, but also, or mainly, in mutually shared values. Human rights, democratic principles, rule of law, and good governance in particular. It must help us in finding common ground to share challenges to democracy, equal representation, and social justice. In other words, we face the same problems, and we would like to discuss and exchange views together for a better future. This year is an special, and it's important, especially important also because we are celebrating the 100th birthday of Nelson Mandela, 100 Cent, uh, anniversary of Nelson Mandela's birthday, which, as you can imagine, is not only inspirational for South Africa, not only for Africa, not only for Europe, but for the rest of the world. 
you can uh, visit uh, an exhibition that is just outside this room about Nelson Mandela, and I will uh, take this opportunity also to welcome the South Africa ambassador who is now with us. Mandela, as you know, was born 18 July 1918 at a time when South Africa black community found itself under a constant, constant oppression. He devoted his life to fight against the apartheid regime to make everyone represented on equal footing. His legacy is different at a time when we see that social justice and equality cannot be taken for granted in our societies. Unfortunately, there are still challenges in South Africa after the end of apartheid, but also elsewhere in Africa and in Europe. A minority of people owes the majority of wealth. Corruption is still a reality. Democratic principles are put under pressure. The mere principle of equality is at risk. So is good governance. The recent and steady rise of populist right-wing illiberal leaders all over the world is undermining our vision of having an inclusive society. The aim of today's conference is twofold. Our first panel will look at Nelson Mandela's legacy in South Africa and neighboring countries. The second will extend the discussion to the state of good governance and democracy in Africa. So I'm calling now to my comrade and colleague Boris Sala, who is Vice President of the European Parliament Delegation in South Africa, to uh, start the first panel together with our guest speakers. So Boris, the floor is yours. Thank you, Enrique. Firstly, allow me to welcome our guests and speakers, which a special, my special pleasure is to welcome Joan Marie uh, Fabs, which is our colleague and the chairman of the, of the uh, South African European Union delegation for more than 10 years, and we are Maybe, maybe more, but I know just 10 years because I am here just 10 years. <laughs> maybe more. We have a lot of common experience, common cooperations, common arguments, mm -hmm. common very creative activities uh, together, and I am very happy that she came so a long way here for the celebration of the 100th anniversary of Nelson Mandela, but I think it's worthy not just because of the Mandela, firstly, of course, but because of our cooperation with the Europe, between the Europe and the, and the Africa. Uh, oh, and I must say, it's a little bit a secret, but, but Joan is a very good, very good poet. I read your last book and was very lyrical, and I was in tears. Uh, <laughs> Then allow me to, to, to welcome Jesse Majome, if I pronounce it in the, in the right way, which is an uh, activist, human rights and women's activist in the Zimbabwe. I am very happy that you are a part of the big changes which now are in your, in your country, and we are all looking with a big hope in the, in the changing situation in, in your country, and we cross our fingers to, to your fight uh, in for the for the women's right, but for the right of every citizens as as well. Uh, then I don't know if it is uh, Madeleine Kunu. Madeleine Kunu, welcome. Uh, she is from South Africa as 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 well, uh, fighting for something like we can say empowering of the of the women. In the, in the South Africa, simply to say the girl's power. Uh, uh, I 
I am very happy and I am quite uh, familiar with the situation uh, in, this, in this fight and it is not easy because it is fight with the prejudices, biases, practices, paternalism and the other things and she is uh, very brave in this, in this fight and I am very happy that she is exactly speaking about the legacy of Mandela because the equality between the men and women was something like, a, like a on the first place on the, between the races and the men and women was the, was the biggest challenge which Mandela foreseen in his, in his activities. Uh, I think that from our panel, everybody, allow me to say some introducing words about the, the 100th anniversary of Nelson Mandela and his legacy. Uh, I am not going to have a long lecture because I am absolutely sure that nobody is a strong word, but from the people I know, including myself, I am not able to say more adequate and accurate uh, about the legacy of Nelson Mandela as was the speech and lecture of the Barack Obama uh, in June in Johannesburg, which he appreciate this whole walk to freedom of the, of the Mandela with very accurate words uh, in a very emotional way on the one, one hand and with the very reasonable uh, 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 way on the, on the other, other hand. I recommend everybody to read this speech of Barack Obama about the legacy of Nelson, Nelson Mandela and it's going to be very, very value, valuable reading. Uh, but allow me from my point of view, just from the, from the political point of view, what I appreciate, appreciate mostly, there are three things. The one is the idea of, metaphorically to say, rainbow, rainbow nation. I think the idea of the rainbow nation is something which can be very educable for the whole world, for the Europe as well. For example, especially in my, in my region, where we have the communities in every country after the monarchical, monarchical rules, the mixed ethnicity, and to create a rainbow nation is the task for every country in Central Europe, for, for example. When I am speaking about the Hungary, Slovakia, Austria, Poland, Czech Republic, and the other countries, we have the same, absolutely the same, the same task and challenge for the creating something we can call the rainbow nations. It is about the tolerance, but not just about the tolerance like a emotional relations to other person, but the tolerance like a political principle. And that is the bridge to the, my second point. That is the second legacy which I appreciate mostly, and I think that is the reason why the South African are living in peace, and that is the constitutionality. The constitutionality as a political system regulated with the democratic rules, but with the law, it is something like a state of law, which is absolutely in, in important for every country because the rule of law is the only tool how to rule within every country in a peaceful way. We have in the European Union the big problem now, we are in argument with some countries which we are from the point of the European Union not happy that they are, they are breaching some, some rule of laws in some countries and we are bitterly fighting with this not countries, but the political representations with the government in these countries which are not sticking to the, to the rule of law. I think, and you can see it in South Africa, that South Africa is a model of the peaceful political development, and it is because the constitutionality. And Nelson Mandela was the man who was absolutely strong 
to establish a constitutional system which is, which is something like a pillar of the South African society as a, as a whole. And the third, of course, was his a big fight against the racism, because the racism is a plug which is crouching very silently to everybody, doesn't matter. And that is the big and the world legacy of Nelson Mandela, that the racism we must fight doesn't matter in which country, in which soul, in which person, let alone the, the, the color of the, of the skin, because the racism is something like a disease which is going to, to govern our own soul when we are looking at the other, other person. To get rid of this, of this vicious and bad customs is something which is a legacy which can the whole world fighting for because nobody, nobody is protected from this virus which can be spread ar around. That are three main, main points uh, which are in my, my imagination about the legacy of Nelson Mandela and I remember it with full honor and when I started my and that is my last sentence. When I started my mandate here in the European Parliament, I was creating something like a presentation brochure or some, <laughs> some leaflet. Uh, uh, and I put there a one, one page with my heroes. And my heroes were on the first place a one man in the Slovak Republic called Lehotsky, which was fighting for the independence and the uh, and, uh, uh, liberation of Slovakia against the monarchical, monarchical uh, uh, oppression from the Hungarians in this time, very similar to the liberation movement of the ANC. And this was the social democratic movement, a very, very, very wide social democratic movement which won this fight. My second hero was Willy Brandt, and Willy Brandt not because of his Ostpolitik, but paradoxically for his, his support of the Spanish and Portuguese people to fight against the oppression of the fascism in the 70s, 60s and the 70s, which sometimes the European are, are forgetting that we have to fight in the middle of the Europe against the fascism in the 60s and 70s, not just through the Second World War. And my third, third hero was Nelson Mandela because, because what Enrique mentioned, his legacy is not a local legacy, is not just the African legacy, it is the heritage which must be developed in the whole world. Thank you. Boris. Um. I'm sorry to, to say that uh, we have only uh, one hour, 15 minutes for a complete debate because uh, we have after that in the European, in, in this place, uh, an important debate with uh, the Spitzen Kandidaten, which is the candidate that will lead the socialists in the European elections in 2019, so we have to leave the room at 3.45, so uh, we cannot allow more than seven to eight minutes each one of the speakers. Thank you. The next speaker is uh, Jesse Majome, deputy just former deputy justice minister from Zimbabwe, and as I said, now the big fighter for the, for the women's right in, in her country. The floor is yours. Oh, is it on already? Yes. It's okay. already. Uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon to you all. I must apologize for being late. I got lost, uh, but I'm glad to be here. And it is an honor for me to join in this uh, celebration of this great son of the world, uh, Nelson Mandela, whose legacy transcends 
all forms of culture, race, um, location, and whatever cause that it is. If you forget everything I say today, I hope you can remember um, one thing. And um, it is this, that wha what I want to say to you today, that we need more Nelson Mandela's in Africa. Uh, no, we don't need more Nelson Mandela's in Africa. We need more Nelson Mandela's in the world. And um, certainly, where I come from, in Zimbabwe, across the border, across the Limpopo River, uh, across from my sister, um, uh, Midlin there, uh, we certainly do need that legacy. And fortunately, uh, we all know that it is impossible to, to replicate a particular human being. Once a human being is born uh, and they live their life, they are gone. But fortunately, the legacy of Nelson Mandela is such that it is lasting. It is indelible. It speaks for itself. And all that we need to do, even if, we, yes, we do need more Nelson Mandela's in the world. We're not going to get them because um, he was an individual. But fortunately, his imprint on life, on governance, on politics, on human rights, on development is so, it's such a huge indelible imprint that all we have to do is to pass that. And if you forget again what I will say, uh, the other thing that I would, I suppose, want to you to remember is that um, from my own personal uh, understanding as a human rights activist, a women's rights activist, and formerly, formerly a political uh, activist, is that for me, um, Nelson Rolin Plata Mandela's legacy for me is, um, shows, is about the power of humility um, to achieve the right, the necessary, and the just. And it is power therefore over self, over the ego, and over the mob, the mob that is always there to demand this, demand that, want this. And the mob is not always wrong, by the way. It, um, <laughs> it usually is powered by very deep and very legitimate concerns. But um, from Nelson Mandela's legacy, we know personally, we know how to silence out the noise and the demands of the mob charging through the barriers to silence it and still listen um, and have that humility to still do the necessary and the right and not necessarily what the mob and what um, the self, the ego also is because uh, in leadership we have to um, always also fight with what it is that we might want to, to achieve and see. Um, and therefore, finally, it is that power to, of humility to do, as I said, to achieve the right, the necessary, and the just over the mob and over the self, but also in order to create lasting and strong institutions as well as processes that carry forward and should perpetuate um, what is right and what is just and what is necessary. And um, uh, like uh, my brother here was saying, um, definitely the issue of institutions as we think about Nelson Mandela's legacy is one thing that I believe uh, one facet that we should all pursue, uh, both even in terms of international cooperation with the, from the European end to the African end to all sorts of even other continents, that if we are able to create, sustain, and develop institutions that do the right and the necessary and the just, we will have been able to remember and um, propel Nelson Mandela's legacy. And uh, I just want to quote something that I found, because you know it's extremely difficult to try and pinpoint in seven minutes <laughs> and talk about the, the Mandela legacy. I mean, he was large, he was huge, he was larger than life. But um, there's uh, a passage that I just want to quote that I found for me that encapsulates what he has done. Um, and uh, it says, the impression Mandela made on the world was not only due to the cause he was fighting for, but also because of the way he handled the consequences that came with the struggle. Even during his overall 27 years in prison, he maintained poise and did not turn bitter. Um, he was offered conditional release multiple times but stayed true to his belief. Uh, I could go on, but I don't mm. have time. Um, mm. 
And then, uh, and then it says that when he was finally released under international pressure in, uh, uh, in 1990, uh, the end of apartheid subsequently followed, and even after he became president of South Africa, he maintained a course that fostered reconciliation between different ethnic groups in the country, rather than promoting revenge for all the years of oppression. And then even after, he and then he retired, and this is important, from coming from the country where I come from, from Zimbabwe. He retired after one term of office, <laughs> but <laughs> remained politically active and engaged in the fight against HIV and AIDS. And that he is a symbol of what can be achieved uh, with true dedication to a cause. And um, for me, in all this, I don't have the time to uh, pick on all those, but I find, for me, it encapsulates those values that um, that that legacy of Mandela has drawn. That if we can only maybe do maybe 50% of it, with the aim of creating, as I said, maintaining and developing institutions, and not persons, uh, because like I said, I come from a country that teaches that we are just across the border. But if we um, continue to build institutions across Zimbabwe, across Africa, and not persons, uh, not the big man syndrome, because at the beginning, I truly believe that, for me, the most endearing and the most illustrious of Nelson Mandela's attributes was humility, that with all the power and the respect that he had, that humility of his that he came across still as a human being is the total antithesis of the big man syndrome and also, sadly, uh, we might start to be seeing also the big woman syndrome, but we don't <laughs> need either. <laughs> we, we need to develop um, and place our power in institutions and processes and constitutions in order to, to, to have that. And um, what I also want to uh, say that just speaking as a, as a woman, um, is that for me, one of the most endearing legacies, again, of Nelson Mandela was the emancipation of women. I look with envy across the border in South Africa um, to see that when um, Nelson Mandela became president, the representation of women in South Africa in parliament was just 2.7%. And now South Africa, well, it's not yet at 50%, uh, like Rwanda and so on, but they are at 44% and they're extremely stable and it is increasing. And it is one of those... Um, I think it's again goes to processes and institutions that the South African constitution that was of course not written by Nelson Mandela alone, but his leadership because of his humility enabled others to also lead and become strong teams and also to, to believe in that vision and be able to work for and in that legacy. Because the more all of us, uh, the more we reduce our volume down as big men or big women and work in teams and propel ideals and therefore build strong institutions, the more we are able to create a society in Africa, in Europe and elsewhere that truly does the just, the right um, and the necessary. And I do not know if I have uh, any more minutes. Uh, one minute. One minute more. So in that minute that I have, I will just list the other, I suppose, effects of that Nelson Mandela legacy of a leadership that we still talk about today through powerful humility. Um, two others, I've mentioned women's emancipation, HIV AIDS. Because of this, he's been able to also lead a lasting impact on at least five other issues. Education, we know, all know about his famous quote about how education is the most powerful weapon that you can use to change the world. And, um, and how in South Africa, he has the Institute for Rural Development and Education that trains high quality teachers to rural areas. Then the fight for children uh, through the Nelson Mandela Children's Fund, and then five promoting scientific and environmental education, resulting in no less than three um, institutions on the African content, continent named after him in science. That is in Burkina Faso, Nigeria, and Tanzania. So we share him not only we share him all of us, and then um, <laughs> of course expanding voting rights in the fight against apartheid, and then the fight for peace and justice in the world. That also even inspired. Uh, the fight for equality across the Atlantic in the civil rights movement. Jesse Jackson um, did say this uh, in, 19, in 2013. Now they were also inspired. So I thank you and uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. 
The next speaker is my neighbor, Joe. Please, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, colleagues, comrades. It is a great honor and pleasure to share some thoughts with you here um, this afternoon. Now, I going to be timing, so you won't have to sort of bring the whip. Right, now, um, Nelson Mandela, you've already heard a lot about him. You've read about him. And the issue becomes for me, what more is there to say? It is really to re-emphasize what many of us have already learned and heard about. He was, for us in South Africa, a freedom fighter, yes. He was also a family father. He's also the father of the nation. But more than that, he is the father of what is best in humanity. And he always referred to this aspect, humanity. To get away from racism, we are one people, one humanity. Simonia, one. Now, during his lifetime, as he said, he had dedicated his life, and he said this from the dock, he dedicated himself to the struggle against the domination of the white man. But he had equally fought for the domination of any other color, so that never again in the history of our country would we see one group oppressed by the other. And it is this principled stance of his, his values, that we can never forget. Indeed, people say he was a very humble man. I'm 74. I've known him a long time since the dock and before. Now, the thing with Comrade Nelson Mandela Tata, as a young man, he was a very arrogant man, came from a, from a royal family. And he loved running around the town with his silk scarf, but still fighting, fighting for freedom as a lawyer. But what he shows us is the human capacity to change. And his good friend, Walter Sisulu, pointed this out. You, you know, let's uh, take it a little bit easy here. And people have forgotten that. Today we remember him from what stood out most in his life after all those years, and that is his sense of humility. But it tells us that he had the capacity to do what Ben Okri called for, very famous Nigerian poet, the capacity to change from within first before you can think of transforming your country. That is what is so important. And it wasn't only that change. He became a highly disciplined cadre. He was a warrior. He was a struggle veteran with strong convictions, such strong convictions that he actually went to the leadership at that time when he was a young man to say, we can't go on like this with peaceful fighting. We have got to, now, we've got to consider an armed struggle. So strong was that conviction, but he had the capacity to persuade people to see the bigger picture and with his good friend, Walter Sisulu, he was able to enable the more conservative, yes, the more conservative members of the leadership to see that perhaps they needed an armed wing outside the country. Um konto we siswe. Later, when he and Chris Harney and many others came back into the country, in fact, the Ravonia trial showed, him the, showed us the metal he had. We never thought that they could hold him in prison all those years. And he himself said, imprisonment had its advantages. 
Well, many of us failed to see what kind of advantage prison had, let alone a solitary cell. But you see, that's the narrow picture. He was trying to show us no mind is ever imprisoned. Your mind is free. And that within that solitary confinement on many occasions and in breaking rocks, he was able himself to reflect on the policies, the ideology of the African National Congress, and he himself. And this became developed as a collective wisdom. So you then had his conviction, which was always there and had remained his dying breath, the commitment. But also, you had more than that. You had that real political conscientization, which began to realize that freedom would never come about, the freedom of a society that could be one society, one nation, unless and unless we saw each other differently. So that demanded of us another look at things. This issue of saying, well, when we get there outside, we're going to actually nationalize everything. That's right. Well, the years in prison, umkhabulu, the capacity to engage each other, encouraged him to see a broader picture. We needed to ensure that we built a cohesive nation, cohesion, conviction, political conscientization, commitment, and everyone who can contribute to a new society should be retained, and we should work together. But it was more than just that. He had compassion, great compassion and caring. And that came about throughout his life with different people. That is why he could talk to almost anyone, from a child to a president, someone who wasn't an intellectual to an academic, because he spoke to the person and cared about you and your life. And he used to say, no person who is oppressed can ever participate effectively in democracy. Because in order to contribute to democracy and enjoy democracy, one must be free. And when he went and spoke to the United Nations in the same year that he was freed, he said, the greatest challenge of our age is now. What is it that we must do to ensure that democracy peace and prosperity prevail everywhere. And he spoke about the need to recognize that some countries had fewer resources. And that is why he's fully supported the strategic partnership with the European Union, why he saw South Africa coming back into the global community, acting as yeast, as a catalyst, to show we have been able to reconcile each other across very broad ideologies. Having said that, in our country today, we need again those values that Mandela had and gave us, because regrettably, like anything in life, if you don't practice your principles, practice your values, you lose it. And that often happens in a country that had great leadership like Mandela, who brought all the people together. We stand on the brink of our most difficult elections because what is at risk is the Mandela legacy. And many of us are doing everything we can. The ordinary person is doing everything he or she can do to try and undo the mistakes that we have made. Because Mandela, and now I see I'm the one who've taken all the time, 
I want to thank you for letting me share those few words because Mandela fostered peace and development, said without peace there can be no development. I thank you. Thank you, thank you, Joe. And now, uh, mm, Madeleine, the floor is yours. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, S SND, for uh, including me in this panel. I'm really honored to be part of this discussion today. Uh, I think for me, the topic is really the most interesting topic. And um, I find it really very appealing that um, I came out with, with few words, few key words in that topic that will be part of my reflection or our reflection this afternoon. And I think those key words will just allow us to be true to ourselves as we say we are celebrating the legacy of Mandela. I will just go straight to those uh, three key words. And the number one key words in our topic is the legacy. The word legacy, when we try to define it, when we try to look at it, are we as global leaders, as African leaders, as African citizens, able to say that we are living Nelson Mandela's legacy? Looking at what's happening for human rights in Africa, looking at what Mandela fought for, equality, tolerance, freedom, and most of all, the emancipation of African people. How can we say that we are, we are living the Mandela legacy when we can see that our young people are dying in the Mediterranean? Just yesterday, 78 kids have been kidnapped in Cameroon, and we're talking about Mandela legacy. Look at what he said when it comes to what, how he was looking at Africa. He said the titanic effort that has brought the liberation of South Africa and ensured the total liberation of Africa constitutes an act of redemption for black people around the world. Can we, are we able, are we bold enough to stand here today as global leaders, as African leaders, as African people, and say, are we celebrating or living the Nelson Mandela's legacy? Second key word in our topic was democracy. They say that we are going to reflect on democracy. Democracy? And I want really us to reflect this afternoon is there democracy in Africa? And here I'm not just talking about South Africa. I'm talking Africa as a whole. Can we say Africa is democratic? Are we applying democratic principles in Africa? I don't know, I'm not a politician. Maybe I do not understand the definition of democracy, but does democracy allows a, uh, a, a leader to stay in, 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 in power for more than two terms in Africa is happening. Or to even stay in power eternally, it's happening. And the, basically the inventors of democracy, they are there. They want us to have democracy. But we, when we compare the way democracy principles are being applied in Africa, and how it's being applied elsewhere. It's different. And sometimes we ask ourselves, is really democracy for us? And again, I would like to quote something that Nelson Mandela said. And he was talking to African leaders. And he said, we pledge ourselves to liberate all our people from continuing bondage of poverty, deprivation, suffering, gender, and other discrimination. So talking about that second word that we are reflecting about this afternoon, democracy, can we say Africa is a democratic continent? 
or do we still have so much to reflect upon how the principles are being applied in certain countries in that continent? And the third key word that really are reflected upon on our topic was good governance. We are reflecting upon good governance in Africa. And honestly, I'm not a politician. However, just being not, not even an activist, I just work with women, women empowerment. But again, we look at the issue of good governance as, as a key issue that will change Africa if, only if, we can have good governance in Africa. But when we look at today, can we really talk about good governance in Africa? Again, a reflection. We say we are reflecting this afternoon. Can we talk about good governance in Africa? When we are seeing with our own eyes, we see African leaders, you know what, for them they just say, you know what, as long as we are pleasing our partners for development, we safe. Nobody will move us from our seat. As long as we just please them. As long as we're in good terms with them. We even just lose our sense of reflection as to how can we manage our own resources. We have lost that. And can we talk about good governance in Africa? Let's just hear what, again, Nelson Mandela said. He said, where globalization means, and it so often does, that the rich and the powerful now have new means to further enrich and empower themselves at the cost of the poor and the weak. And the weak. We have the responsibility to protect in the name of universal freedom. Ladies and gentlemen, if we are celebrating the legacy of Nelson Mandela, I again invite you this afternoon to reflect on those key words in our topic this afternoon so we can remain true to ourselves that this afternoon we were discussing a certain topic, but what does it mean for you? What does it mean for me? What does it mean for partners for development? Because Africa is not working alone. He needs partners. Mandela fought not only for political, political freedom, but he fought for economic emancipation of African people. He fought for dignity of African people. He fought for freedom of African people. And least but not least on, uh, on my list, he fought for win-win partnership. When he said, it does not matter the color of our skin, Let's live together in harmony. Let's share the resources that we do have. That's what Nelson Mandela lived and died for. Can we say, as we sit here today, as global leaders, as African leaders, as even just normal citizens like me, that we are celebrating Mandela's legacy, as we celebrate today, and I think it's worth it to just remind ourselves of what he fought for and what he died for. It's important to always have this, but we need to remain true to ourselves most of the time and reflect on things that are happening in our motherland. But also our partners need to join hands with us with true sense of love and unity and to say that when are we going to see that land being free? And I think in conclusion, I just want to conclude with repeating some words from some global leaders. As an African, I think I'm longing to see the day when our African leaders will confidently say, like some global leaders, that after building other nations, a time to build our own nations, and we shall make Africa great again. Thank you. Thank you.
you, Madeleine. Yes, it was very educable and emotional. Uh, thank you very much. We have not too much, too much time. Uh, I think maybe, maybe we can manage the situation in the way that we can go continuously to the second panel, because it is about the topic you mentioned about the good governance in the, in the African continent. I think the problem of the good governance is the legacy of Nelson Mandela as well. That means I am understand it that we are going to the second subject, uh, but in the same framework of the legacy of Nelson Mandela. I take my colleagues, which uh, had a very interesting and inspirational speeches, and I uh, look forward and cross my fingers to all you to fight for the Mandela's legacy especially in the, for the African leaders, which are not 50 years in the incumbents <laughs> in the power, and uh, for the women's right, of course, in the, in the Zimbabwe, and I am very optimistic in the, in the last, last year, in South Africa as well, in Zimbabwe, and I think it is spreading to the whole Africa. We can see it in Ethiopia, in the other countries, but it is the next subject. Thank you very much, Enrique, your is the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Boris, and the three panelists for the tribute to Nelson Mandela and his legacy. I would like to open a broad discussion to the state of good governance and democracy in, in Africa. I'm calling our prominent guests. Zanetor Rowlings and Rafael Marquez de Moraes, please come to it. I will start presenting uh, our two panelists. Zanetor Rowling, it's a Ghanaian uh, politician who serves as a member of parliament in Ghana since 2016, representing National Democratic Congress. Uh, she has participated in various humanitarian works to advocate the rights of women and children and improve sanitation in Ghana. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, he, she has a medical degree in the Royal College of Surgeons of Ireland. <laughs> Must be a very, a, a very good place to become uh, a doctor. And Rafael Marquez de Moraes is an Angolian journalist and human rights defender. He has a long uh, curriculum, or he has a long curriculum here, but uh, I can summarize saying that he has been uh, in the opposition to uh, regime in Angola, and especially the President Santos, uh, once uh, he wrote an article titled The Lipstick of Dictatorship, and uh, his case was taken uh, before the United Nations that protected you, if uh, can be protection <laughs> in, <laughs> in those cases. <laughs> and um, he has awarded many, many, uh, important prizes, but I can say that some of them are very inspirational. For instance, Human Rights Watch, which is so important institution, uh, so important uh, to have this prize for a, a person who is fighting for the protection of human rights. But also, uh, he has been uh, awarded with the Percy Covosa Award for Outstanding Courage from the National Association of Black Journalists, an institution of USA, who is a country that is now voting, uh, we expect for good reasons. Let's see what happens at the end of the night. But in any case, uh, Rafael, what are they? And uh, you, you are the first to take the floor. Uh, Zanetor, the floor is yours. 
Thank you very maybe, much. Maybe before you start, maybe. What you are preparing, what you have prepared, a little about the Ghana example of good governance, because in general terms, it's taken by a, a country in much better situation considering good governance in comparison with other African countries. GPF, the, the, the platform that we uh, are now organizing this uh, debate, we organized one month ago in Ghana a meeting with uh, millennials from Africa, uh, young people discussing about democracy, and of course they in some way were, were critical with the situation because you must always be critical because you want to improve the democracy in any stage, but at the same time, when we look other parts of Africa, maybe uh, Ghana, in comparative terms, is in a better situation. So again, no more than eight to 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Is it eight to 10 minutes to answer your question or in general, all? In general. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm honored to be here and um, I think this uh, counts as important in terms of the uh, discourse that needs to happen given the shifting sands when we look at the, um, the current status of democracy globally. It, it does appear as though uh, democracy is having an existential crisis, not just in Africa but across the world. And um, it makes one have to question, do we need to perhaps look at how we interpret what it means to have good governance in any country? The principles are what they are, you know, whether it's transparency, whether it's the, um, the, the right to have your voice heard, whether it's um, good leadership, whether it's the institutions that are functioning in a timely manner in terms of response to the people. But um, to first perhaps address um, your, your question with regards to Ghana, the, um, the National Democratic Congress, as you know, is a social democratic um, congress, um, it's a social democratic party, and um, we are now, perhaps you could say, left of center, and the current government is um, right of center. That's the, the phraseology that we all find ourselves using now. I think that um, if I may answer the, your question with regards to us being critical of where we find ourselves, if as an athlete, you judge yourself by the, the, the performance of other athletes, then you will remain where you are. In order to ensure that you're excelling and going beyond what you've achieved and not just living on past glories, you do need to have that regular introspection, that reflection and the self-critical analysis that gives you that opportunity to say, how can I be better than I am now? How can I be better than I was? And therefore, to have a situation where you have a meeting in Ghana and we are critical of the situation as it exists, says that we are not blind to the fact that it's not a perfect situation. It also means that there's room to improve and room to learn, which is important for where we find ourselves in globally today. I think that um, with regards to the issues of good governance, we, we know what the basic principles are. And, um, it always comes down to a balance of ethical leadership. I'm particularly passionate about ethical leadership because if you have the institutions in place, the institutions are made up of people. It doesn't matter how wonderful an institution is. If the people within the institution don't d display a certain level of morality or ethics, it will be corrupt. And corruption has become mainstream. Now corruption is not viewed as totally unacceptable, it's become the gray area that exists and it's almost seen as, well, if things are going okay, I suppose we could ignore it. But as long as we continue to make provision for corruption and allow it to continue to grow, just like the virus that you spoke about metaphorically, it will only get bigger to the point where, where we find ourselves is monetization of politics. So you don't have the best leaders in place, you don't have the most qualified people, but you may certainly have the wealthiest people, which doesn't make for the best leadership. And if we have that discourse driven purely by who can pay the most to the voters or to whoever is deciding, whether it's at the partisan level or national level, then you're dealing with a crisis. If we can't have those honest conversations, then we are looking at undermining the very basis of everything that we're doing. And if, back to the issue of why we must be able to be critical about ourselves in Ghana, if 
the discourse as we're having it does not continue, if we can't make sure that we're nipping in the bud certain things that are negative and undermining democracy and good governance in Ghana, if Ghana fails, it will be a very difficult situation for you to preach democracy to the rest of the continent and other countries that you say are not doing much better. So, yes, Ghana is doing well compared to others, but how are we reinforcing what we have to make sure it succeeds? Because when you have a situation, um, a week and a half ago, I was in Brussels for the IEA conference. And as you know, Germany is moving away from nuclear energy. And one of the, the delegates who is from the continent stood up and said, well, if, if Germany is moving away from nuclear energy, why are we being asked to take it up? The point I'm making is when you have something as your gold standard and you're, you refer to it as the example, and it starts to fail or it goes a different way, the question that get, uh, gets asked by people who you're saying should follow that example is, but if it's failing there, why should we go down the same path? Crucial with regards to good governance, crucial with regards to the establishment and consolidation of democracy are the cultural context, the socioeconomic situation. Poverty and greed are very big drivers of corruption. Why is it so easy to have this uh, issue of monetization of politics, for example? If people are not impoverished, if people are economically empowered, no one can bribe them with money to make a choice. No one can blackmail them into making a choice based on the money that they're offering. If the structures are working properly in a timely fashion, in a timely fashion where what needs to be done gets done when it needs to be done, regardless of regime change, regardless of who is in power, then it's not a winner takes all. Then it's not a do or die situation where if the party that gets in is not the one you support, the road that leads to your community won't get constructed, the hospital that was being constructed under the previous government will be brought to a stop. The schools that were being built will stop being built. These are important issues that within the context, context of Africa we need to look at. Because one takes for granted in the West, for example, that we do have ideological differences in, in you know, how we see things. But ultimately, there are certain structures or certain things that are ring-fenced, which means regardless of whether it's your party that's in power or not, there are certain things that cannot be touched that must not be touched. And we need to really look at that seriously on the continent if we're to make sure that there's sustainable development, if we're to make sure that true consolidation of democracy occurs. And if we're to make sure that within the scope of democracy, behind the veneer is not a different uh, picture that's, that's actually occurring. Because to a large extent, you can have situations where there is this phase of democracy in the front, but just very slightly behind that is a totally different story. And then it becomes convenient for the international community to say, oh, well, but that country is democratic without acknowledging the issues behind. As a medical doctor, I like to get to the core of issues. If we're dealing with issues and we can't have those honest conversations of what's really the symptom and the cause of the symptom and we're just treating the superficial issues, we won't deal with these issues and the, the foundation will be shaky. It won't stand. So these are really important things, and it really comes down to perhaps we need to look at how do we seriously adapt each situation to each country. I have three children. I treat them differently, not because I love them one more than the other, but because each child has its own personality. Her personality is different from the other. They have different love languages. How do we contextualize this within the, the situation of governance in Africa and across the world? without rubber stamping and saying, this is the way it has to be. We must recognize that there are variations in that presentation, provided we have these universal principles on which we operate. And then we kind of tweak it to, um, to see how it suits each country. The, um, the, the, I think the Center for Bhut uh, Bhutanese Studies came up with this, um, I think, what did they call it, the, the, the well-being well factor, which is supposed to be the human phase of GDP. And what it does is it takes you away from the numbers and puts a face to what you call being better off. How can we do that within the scope of good governance in the continent and across the world? If we look at um, 
for example, what, what's going on in um, various countries, and we look at, say, post-conflict reconstruction, if we look at peace building, if we look at um, conflict resolution, gender mainstreaming is so important and has been more recognized recently for the fact that the more women you have on a body that's dealing with peace building, on a body that's dealing with conflict resolution, the more lasting and the more solid the peace you will find. Kweji Agri, a Ghanaian who was born in 1875, I believe, and um, he, he, he passed away in 1927. This was before Ghana won her independence. His statement was, if you educate a man, you educate an individual. If you educate a woman, you educate a nation. If we are not going to have the issue of gender mainstreaming as a main topic, and it always comes under the issue of gender rather than a central issue that matters all the time, we will not achieve these things we're talking about. All the SDGs, all the SDGs require the full participation of women who have been empowered because a lot of women do a lot of work. A lot of women, as this is it's one of um, proverb, and um, I think my South African colleagues will have to correct me if I'm wrong. The woman is the fabric of a nation. She holds a nation together. However, very, very often, the woman's role in holding the nation together, even from a non-formal economic sector, is not recognized. It hasn't been quantified. But if the women pulled away, most nations on the continent would collapse. How are we looking at these issues and giving women their rightful place within the center stage of how we move forward with good governance? I think if we can look at that issue, it helps to restore the balance of society, which has now been a little bit skewed because it's, we, we're dealing with so much populism, where issues are taken without the long-term effect. How do we look at ring-fencing issues that are core to a nation's sustainable development, so that regardless of which political power is in, 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 in control or who, which regime is, is currently voted in, the vision of a nation does not get sidetracked. How do we make sure this happens? How do we make sure that our young people are connected without this gap between the governed and the so-called governing elite? As long as there's this, this gap, somebody, you know, a small group of people is going to be left to do the job and also left to carry the blame. But if we are one, if we truly are one, then we must integrate. There must be that strong voice where those who are being governed understand that they are actually part of the governing group because governance starts with the self. How are we looking at that at the individual level, at the interpersonal level, in order for it to translate onto the national level? If we are not addressing these issues, then we are really going to keep having a lot of these conversations because these are conversations that are not new. And I don't think anything that I've said today is new. But how do we translate it to the point where it is not a, um, an abstract concept for a few members of parliament or members of the executive or judiciary or some members of the media or concerned um, you know, civil society organizations, but everybody getting involved? We need to look at how we integrate everyone. Leadership with conscience makes sure that there's a group of people who are within this area of being governed who are fully aware so they can make informed choices, so they can be a proper watchdog to those who they've chosen to represent them. Because if those representing the people are actually not doing what they must do, then truly they are not representing the people. I've been given a little notice there to, uh, <laughs> to end my, my little statement here. I think um, in, in, in summary, I would say that we need to look at how we create a paradigm shift on the continent and across the globe. A lot of the issues that Europe is suffering from with regards to migration are not as simple as people are leaving the continent. Until we reach a point where economic um, interests are no longer more important than the issues of fundamental human rights. We won't see an end to these problems. True integration, the true sustainability of development, of democracy, of making sure that all people are treated equal, is to make sure that we look at all these issues and not put another country's economic development or interests ahead of the fundamental human rights of others who are less fortunate. Thank you. Thank you.
What is democracy and good governance in Africa? There's a whole industry of scholarship and political arguments developed around these two issues. In light of Mandela's wisdom, and to address the polity and the relationship between the rulers and the ruled on the continent, I turn to an Angolan and African proverb. When the drums are fine-tuned, the wolves dance with the goats. Angola is a case in point whereby, once again, an African country has an historical opportunity to fine-tune its drums to prevent the new leadership becoming a pack of wolves and the people a herd of goats. The tragic story of Africa lies in the fact that more, that, more often than not, um, African rulers, the so-called big men, are the first to prey on their own people, oppress them, rob them, and debase them. Uh, President Lorenzo came into power in Angola a year ago, virtually challenging the status quo of his own party, the ruling Empelia, which has been in power for 43 years. Uh, since independence in 75, his predecessor, José Eduardo Santos, and the MPLA had institutionalized corruption as the way of life, plundering the country, and the people became the cardinal rule of those in power. These were the times of insatiable and weak wolves. Society had to adapt through the Darwinian concept uh, of the survival of the fittest. Uh, President Lorenzo is first and foremost addressing the scourge of corruption, making it clear that impunity among his own peers is over. Uh, the son of former President Dushantos um, has been sent to jail to be made an example of for siphoning off $3 billion from Angola's uh, sovereign wealth fund. S the second important issue is the freedom of expression that is gaining ground in Angola and fostering new spaces of dialogue and accountability as the good-willed president wants to make things right. This is the first time in the country's modern history that all relevant sectors of society seem to embrace the same principle for change in the country. It starts with the routing of institutional corruption that fueled so much violence and repression. Corruption also rendered the state institutions dysfunctional and served to buy international legitimacy and support for the status quo, as foreign enterprises helped to rape and bleed the country dry. But for the president to succeed, there are two major obstacles that he needs to address and establish bridges of dialogue with the opposition and civil society for the country's drums to be fine-tuned. First, it is the economy. Angola's economy is exclusively dependent on oil. 95% of our uh, revenues come from, uh, export revenues come from oil. And um, when President Lorenzo took over power, the oil price averaged $52 um, dollars per barrel. Now is at uh, $75, 76 but there has not been um, a relief uh, the way people have been living with this increase in oil prices because Angola is heavily indebted, especially to China. Just uh, last year, the Chinese ambassador uh, went public to say that Angola had borrowed over $50 billion from China. And much of our oil now goes to repay that debt, not for uh, building the country. And just to give you an idea, the 2019 state budget uh, allocates 42 point, uh, million euros a day to service the debt. And this represents 48% of all the expenditures in our state budget. Much of it goes to pay uh, people abroad. Uh, the second question is, uh, with regarding the economy, the president has the same team from his predecessor. The same individuals uh, that were responsible for much of the corruption, much of the worst practices, are the same that have been tasked with turning around the economy. And we have a major problem with that because uh, many of these individuals are also the principal business people 
Uh, it has been a case of self-dealing for so many years that the senior officials in the government are also the top business people in the country. And there has not been a clear establishment of boundaries between what is public and what is private. Um, also, and the economy will be the determinant factor on how the government and the people interact without the need for the authorities to resort to the old ways of repression and to silence dissent because uh, people are getting restless for uh, many companies are closing down and employment rates are extremely high and um, even though the president is extremely popular for um, uh, jailing his own comrades for corruption, uh, people still need jobs and people still need to eat education and health services need to be improved. And that is not happening because uh, one of the main problems and the hindrances the president faces is that um, he has to rely solely on the members of his own party uh, to run the country. And it is time for him to look beyond partisanship to find the brain power to change um, the country. There's also another problem, uh, the old habits. Uh, just to give you an idea, uh, for instance, uh, the country is either run by the party members that have destroyed it or by foreign consultancy. And just on October 25, President Lawrence issued a decree authorizing the national oil company to spend $50 million on foreign consultancy uh, for next year without any public tender. And uh, on top of that, uh, and this is a company that has uh, endless studies done by uh, foreign consultants. On top of that, the president also authorized an additional $13 million for members of parliament to buy luxury cars. And last year, their budget for luxury cars for 220 members of parliament was $77 million, American dollars. Um, and this is where the idea of uh, tuning the drums for common ground and the betterment of society becomes a dream because of these old habits. Uh, and the president's balancing act between his pack of wolves and the gods that he's trying to serve and protect uh, is becoming quite dangerous. Uh, another major problem we have, the second problem, is the Constitution. It was carefully tailored to suit President Duchanto's with uh, Napoleon Bonaparte's features. And the fundamental thrust of the Constitution is an imperial presidency, not subject to any oversight. And just to give you an example, the president is elected indirectly. The first name on the list of the party that wins the elections automatically becomes the president. So people cannot vote directly for the president, no parliament can vote directly for the president. Um, and the president has absolute powers under the Constitution, which creates a problem. We cannot rely on the goodwill of the president to run the country. We need strong institutions. Uh, and that's where Obama has said loud and clear that Africa does not need uh, strong men but strong institutions. And so unless there are constitutional reforms to ensure that power is devolved to the state institutions, and if we just rely on the goodwill of the current president, uh, we will not see much changes because once uh, there is a crisis, the tendency will be for the president to use his full constitutional powers uh, to ensure he remains in power and keep people uh, in check. And uh, the whole point here is will President Lorenzo choose wisdom as Mandela did for the greater good or the unchecked powers of the Constitution to rule? And this is the main question in Angola. Thank you. Thank you. We have uh, about 10 to 15 minutes, so we can allow uh, people in the audience uh, can express uh, his, her vision of uh, Mandela's legacy or can put questions to our panelists. 
or uh, can just uh, express uh, his or her vision about situation of human rights or good governance in Africa. So if you raise your hand, I will give you the floor. Okay? Not, not, not two at the same time. First you, and then you. So first you. Merci. Je, je m'appelle Martin Ziguilé, je suis député en République centrafricaine. Euh, je suis président du MLPC. Je vous remercie pour l'invitation. J'ai bien suivi, euh, je suis avec beaucoup d'attention les témoignages sur le président Mandela. C'était effectivement un grand homme, et impressionnant aussi, parce que je l'ai rencontré une fois à New York. Ce n'est pas facile de l'approcher. Mais je voudrais revenir sur ce que euh, poser deux questions à Mme Koumou par rapport à Nkoumou, par rapport à son intervention très très remuante sur l'état de la démocratie en Afrique. C'est vrai que euh, lorsqu'on est un parti social-démocrate en Afrique comme le MLPC, on se pose beaucoup de questions sur l'enracinement de la démocratie. Et nous avons un phénomène euh, euh, d'éclatement de, des de, de formes traditionnelles connues de, de, de l'organisation sociale. Je vais être plus simple. Aujourd'hui, les jeunes qui sont sans emploi, qui sont sans espoir, qui sont dans l'économie informelle, qui sont au bord des rues, dans les stades, etc., j'ai l'impression que c'est eux qui font l'opinion dans les villes, dans les zones périurbaines et même dans les zones rurales en Afrique. Les réponses qui sont apportées à leurs attentes, c'est le populisme. C'est l'exclusion des autres, parce qu'en Afrique aussi, on est des étrangers par rapport à des étrangers d'un autre pays, à, par rapport à des compatriotes venant d'un autre pays. Et les phénomènes de perpétuation, de durée au pouvoir, de, 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 de violation du nombre de mandats constitutionnels, c'est des problèmes que nous rencontrons également euh, euh, beaucoup plus fréquemment en Afrique aujourd'hui que hier. Mais nous ne devons pas ignorer également qu'il y a un certain nombre de pays, euh, dont l'Afrique du Sud d'ailleurs, hein, qui continuent à jouer, malgré tout ce qu'on peut dire, euh, un rôle de, 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 de sentinelle. Je suis centrafricain, je suis voisin de la RD Congo, vous voyez ce que je veux dire. Si ce pays n'était pas, s'était pas engagé, l'Angola aussi, dans une certaine mesure, s'était pas engagé, nous serions aujourd'hui en guerre. Et le Congo démocratique, c'est 70 millions d'habitants et c'est plus de près de 10 pays voisins. Vous voyez l'implosion qu'on aurait connue dans cette région-là de l'Afrique, et alors que certains pays voisins sont déjà dans une situation de quasi belligérance. Donc, je pense que l'héritage de Mandela n'a pas complètement disparu en Afrique du Sud. Il y a un leadership qui est là. Et comme nul n'est prophète chez soi, peut-être qu'en Afrique du Sud, on ne voit pas ça clairement, mais nous, nous sentons, nous sentons de loin que c'est quand même un des rares pays en Afrique où il y a des prises d'opposition qui se rapprochent le plus possible des idéaux, des valeurs de liberté, et je ne cite pas tous les domaines. Ça, c'est la première question. La deuxième question, c'est que aujourd'hui en Afrique, il est difficile, il est difficile aux partis socialistes et sociodémocrates de travailler lorsqu'ils ne sont pas au pouvoir. C'est extrêmement difficile. Pourquoi je le dis Parce que le capitalisme, ou les effets du capitalisme, ou ce que Lénine parlait, euh, Lénine disait que le, le capitalisme, c'est le stade suprême de l'impérialisme, nous le vivons dans notre vie quotidienne, dans nos vies quotidiennes. Nous sommes la cible des forces, des forces, j'allais dire, euh, euh, classiques, des forces de la... Hein, des forces... Euh, de droite, il faut dire les choses clairement. Et c'est pour ça que je suis venu ici pour dire que il faut que la, la solidarité qu'il y a entre les, 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 les parlementaires ou que vous voulez mettre en œuvre entre les parlementaires euh, euh, sociodémocrates européens et ceux d'Afrique, il, il faut qu'ils soient beaucoup plus agissants. Nous ne pouvons pas influencer le cours des choses 
si nous ne nous inscrivons pas, même dans le plus petit formalisme démocratique, avec l'élection, avec la, la régularité des élections que nous avons souvent en Afrique aujourd'hui. Et je, je, je finis là. Il faut que l'Afrique du Sud regarde pas seulement les pays anglophones d'Afrique, il faut qu'il regarde toute l'Afrique parce que je pense que l'héritage de Mandela aussi, c'est le fait qu'il s'est d'abord euh, il s'est d'abord senti africain avant de se sentir sud-africain et surtout africain du sud et j'en finis. Merci, là. merci votre parole pour éviter qu'on parle tout simplement de l'Afrique anglophone, moi je me permets de parler un peu en français aussi euh, mais je vous demande en tout cas de, de brèves in, euh, interventions parce que sinon, avec la seconde, on va finir le temps qui nous est disponible. Pour vous, oui. euh, Merci bien. Euh, chers camarades, parce que ce qu'on soit, on doit s'appeler. Euh, le premier panel qui a parlé de l'héritage de Nelson Mandela a résumé véritablement tout le contenu d'un socio-démocrate dans les grands principes de démocratie et dans les grands principes de gouvernance et de bonne gouvernance. M. Eliko dit d'être précis, on voudrait faire des commentaires euh, et apporter un peu, un plus. Mais avant, je voudrais relever quelque chose. Pour moi, pour ma vision, il n'existe pas un social démocrate d'Espagne, de, de Ghana, du Niger, du Burkina, du Mali. Non. Un social démocrate est un social démocrate. Il n'y en a pas. Vous voyez, ça apporte des valeurs. Ça apporte des principes. Donc, pour moi, en parlant de Nelson Mandela, que nous avons reconnu un grand monsieur dans ce sens-là, effectivement, qui est de peau noire, mais il est de peau blanche, jaune, vert, rouge. Pourquoi À cause de ses valeurs et de ses vertus. Il s'est forgé dans la lutte. Et c'est la lutte-là qu'il a conduit en prison. Mais il ne s'est pas forgé seul. Il était dans un courant. Il était dans une association, dans un groupe. Maintenant, moi, ma question, ce que je pense qu'on doit faire, comment effectivement conserver, conserver ces groupes dans des grandes de valeurs et de, et de principes de démocratie, de bonne gouvernance, dans la perspective de gérer au mieux nos pays si nous venons au pouvoir. Moi, je m'appelle Alpha Ousmane du Burkina Faso. Donc, je suis un pays qui est de la société démocratique depuis aujourd'hui une quarantaine d'années. Nous avons un lycée, le lycée de Nelson Mandela. Ce n'est pas parce qu'il est sud-africain, c'est parce qu'il porte des valeurs. C'est pour cela qu'on l'appelle. On a appelé ce lycée-là, lycée de Nelson Mandela. Donc, pour moi, effectivement, l'héritage de Nelson Mandela, à travers l'ANC, à travers les, les, certains partis politiques, doivent être portés et les meilleurs. Et pour cela, il faut qu'on évite les cultes des personnalités. Il faut qu'on évite les cultes des personnalités. Je viens d'écouter le camarade de l'Angola qui parlait un peu de ceci, de cela. Non. Il faut que les partis politiques de la social démocratie soient des partis forts. Donc, ils sont au-dessus des individus, de des institutions fortes. Et je rejoins la, la camarade du Ghana, Mme Rolex, sur cette question qui, effectivement, a bien caricaturé la question. Et donc, pour qu'on ne se perde pas, il faut qu'on reste dans nos principes, dans nos valeurs et effectivement de bonne, de bonne gouvernance. Si je prends l'Afrique de l'Ouest aujourd'hui, la Côte d'Ivoire, depuis 2011, après l'institution post-électorale, est en train de graver des échelons en termes de bonne gouvernance. Le Burkina Faso n'eût été cette guerre asymétrique contre le tourisme, international, le, le, le tourisme que nous subissons, le Mali, le Niger, le Burkina et, 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 et le, 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 le Tchad. Il y a beaucoup d'éléments, beaucoup de paramètres intéressants de bonne gouvernance qui sont effectivement vus. Parce qu'en matière de bonne gouvernance, il y a aussi la promotion des droits humains. Il y a la protection des, des, des civils. Bon, c'est le temps qui fait que je crois qu'on ne peut pas, effectivement... Merci. Si j'avais d'autres éléments sur la question. Merci. Euh, de l'autre côté, là Oui euh. All, our, all protocols observed. I'm very happy to be here. Mine is a simple question. The Social Democratic Party, 
what is your main agenda in Africa? What is happening in Cameroon now and the killings happening? What is your agenda? Then in Nigeria, there is a big question about who is ruling Nigeria and the killings and what is your agenda? Thank you. I will give you both two minutes each one if you want to comment or to respond in general and we have to finish because you have seen uh, people working on the uh, on this um, sal because we are going to have uh, an important meeting so, so thank you very much for some reason i thought he was addressing you Yes, I, I think he was addressing you when he said the social democratic, but anyway. Um, I, think, I think within the uh, West African sub-region, there are a lot of layers to the, um, the issue of what's going on in Nigeria and in Cameroon. And um, a, lot of the, the, a lot of the facts that underlie these conflicts and these you know, atrocities are not being made public. There have been several delegations that have been to both countries, to those specific areas dealing with them, and you know they, they end up, um, I suppose, being expressed in a, an almost watered down version because of the issues of national security, supposedly, and um, which, is, which is actually part of it. But a lot of the time, there's a, there's a lot of uh, this, this discrepancy between the wealthy and those who don't have, which drives a lot of this as well. You know, um, I would not, I would not be in the best position to answer your your question perfectly, because I think it's something that would have to rely on people who are in the country as well. But if one looks at the layers behind what causes conflict, what what causes these human rights violations, I think we come back to the same issues of good governance, of transparency, and of enforcement of the rule of law which I think perhaps we sometimes take a little bit for granted and as business continues because other economic interests end up you know, taking precedence, things keep going on and um, if one doesn't have a platform on which to express these issues, they don't usually get um, addressed. Um, I'm not quite sure, you see your question asked about what is the, you know, as a social democratic party, what, what is its objective, what is its aim? It's, my, the party that I belong to is in Ghana and it's not part of your government, so it's difficult to answer that question exactly. Um, but I think it really comes down to the enforcement of the rule of law as well as good governance and the people need to perhaps call their leaders to account as well. And perhaps just um, a little side issue, as we remember uh, Madiba, we also remember Mrs. Sisulu who is also celebrating 100 years. Far too often history forgets the role women have played in getting us where we are. I would like just to point out the need for uh, Africans to be more engaged in their own affairs, like in the case of Cameroon. Uh, very little, not just Cameroon, Togo and other places. Uh, oftentimes we wait for Europe to take the lead, or European institutions, when uh, that solidarity, that concern must come from African civil society institutions, uh, African political uh, parties, and so I've been contacted by a friend in Cameroon and said, well, can you help? Uh, and I think that's the question we ought to be thinking. How do we help to address the situation in Cameroon, in Cameroon as African citizens? Thank you. That's my yeah. uh, Maybe uh, for one who chair a debate is, uh, is not the right person to ask to respond to questions. But in any case, I think that in your intervention, you said that you have two, three children. All of them are your children, but all of them are different. And uh, the values of the social democracy are the same in each part of the world. But probably the way that we have to implement in the different continents of different countries 
must take in consideration the specific characteristics of the country or of the continent, not putting in risk the values, but trying to interpret the values in correspondence with the, the real situation that they have to confront. And uh, just to end this debate on time, you, when I stand up, you will realize that I am in favor of good institutions instead of the big man. And uh, this is my way to close it. Thank you very much. <laughs>